Good evening, and welcome to the ASA informational webinar. Tonight's webinar will open with some remarks from Dr. Avenstein, followed by a presentation on the SGR repeal by Dr. Stan Stead and Ms. Sharon Merrick. A general Q&A will be conducted at the conclusion mm -hmm. of the topic presentation. It is planned that this webinar will conclude by 7.45 or 8 p.m. Central Daylight Time. I will now turn things over to Dr. Avenstein. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank you for um, signing on this evening. Uh, this is a remarkably important topic for uh, our patients and for our profession. Uh, as you know, um, earlier this year, the uh, Congress um, passed and the President signed the SGR reform bill, which repealed the uh, sustainable growth rate. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, there are new uh, policies regarding payment as well as uh, quality reporting. So this evening, uh, Sh uh, Sharon Merrick, our Director of Payment and Practice Management, and uh, Stan Stead, our Vice President for Professional Affairs, are going to go into great detail as to the implications of the SGR uh, repeal bill will have on us moving into the future. Uh, Sharon, are you going to start off on this? Yes, I will. Thank you, Dr. Abenstein. Thank you. Starting off, again, I thank you very much for joining us tonight. We're very glad to be able to spend the time to talk about this very important, pivotal, key change to the way physicians are going to be paid for their services in the future. We're hoping after tonight's webinar you'll be able to be more familiar with these changes um, that are going to happen now that SGR has been revealed. You're going to be able to know some of the elements of the MIPS program and the alternative payment models and, that are going to be moving into Place, and we'll be talking of some of the details that are available about those programs tonight. And this is um, an issue or a, a, one of those situations in which more detail is going to become available over the weeks and months and potentially even years ahead. And ultimately, we'll be able to understand the short and long-term implications of these payment systems. But before we get started, let's take a poll, a little pulse check or baseline information. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, please, based on the information, the knowledge that you have so far, how do you think this SGR repeal, MACRA, is going to impact your practice? And you can indicate your responses on the, uh, on the deck. Just click on the, the, uh, the answer that best answers your, that best responds to your thoughts. And we'll just give that a few minutes for the poll to fill. So it looks like most people think this is going to have a negative impact, um, pretty evenly split between somewhat negative or significantly in, uh, negative impact. But there are a few people who see some positives here as how MACRA is going to impact their practice. Let's take another pulse check, if you will. And the same question, only this time answer the question based on how you think it is going to impact the specialty as a whole. And please enter your, you can enter your uh, responses whenever you're ready. All right, it looks uh, pretty similar responses going forward. Going forward, though, before we head into the future, it's always a good idea to take a, take a minute and figure out where are we coming from. And where we're coming from is the sustainable growth rate. We got it as part of the Balanced Budget Act of 1997, and it, um, it, this, uh, I want to spend some time going over the mechanisms of the SGR formula. Essentially, this has a lot of those targets that we've been hearing so much about, and those targets actually weren't bad until about 2001, 2002, when the economic picture of the country changed so dramatically. SGR tied spending to certain targets. If we exceeded targets, there was room for a positive update the next year. Or I'm sorry, if we did not exceed those targets, we had a positive update in the following years. If we exceeded those targets, though, then we had to pay the money back, and that would be the negative update. And as you can see, it was based on the change in the fees, the change in the number of beneficiaries, the country's GDP, 
and any changes in law or regulation. If new services came into the picture, those weren't always going to be budget neutral. We could be have um, some, the target could be set to keep that in mind. The targets were just one factor of the conversion factor. There was also the MEI, which is basically, in a nutshell, the cost of running your practices. The update adjustment factor, the UAF, now that was the real kicker there because that was component that, that was responsible for the cliff. That's where the carryover would be. When each year, if we exceeded a target, that, that, that amount by which we exceeded carried over into following years. And then there was also budget neutrality came into play. When relative value units were changed from one year to the next, if that was going to result in more than $20 million moving one way or the other, the conversion factor had to be adjusted to bring that back down into that plus or minus $20 million range. Some years, that $20 million seems like budget dust. For instance, the year that the evaluation and management codes were revalued, that moved $4 billion. But these same rules for the targets and all these other components were, were applied to both the resource-based relative value system conversion factor, which was the dollar per unit for the non-anesthesia services you perform, such as blocks and line placements, and it was also same rules for the anesthesia conversion factor. But the one thing that we do know for sure, it didn't take too long for the wheels to come off. By 2002, we saw our very first negative update. And remember, this just went in to play, so to speak, um, with the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. 2002 was the only year where the negative update actually went through. We've exceeded targets every year since then. Um, this chart and the next one sort of explain what happened in all those years that we ended up having 17 separate and distinct overrides over the years. In 2001, the anesthesia conversion factor was $17.83. In 2002, it dropped to $16.60. Um, the update implemented column there on the very right of your screen, that was the update from statute. Remember, there would be other factors that came into play to influence this. And the other notable thing I wanted to point out on this slide is you can see there was a lot of changes in 2010. That was a really tough year because Congress kicked the can in very, very short distances, and there had to be a lot of separate overrides in that year. And of course, this continued. As I said, there were 17 different overrides all those years, which really showed that the formula didn't work. Another thing that could show that the formula wasn't working and that actually physicians were having some difficulties is the erosion that we saw of the fee-for-service payments that you received. If you take a look at the blue bar in each one of these graphs, you can see it's just going down and down and down while the, the uh, negative incentives for PQRS, meaningful use, and the value-based payment modifier are ever increasing. And of course, sequestration, the 2% off the top, is just the cherry on top of all of these cuts. One thing we do want to point out is for meaningful use here in 2018, we used a figure of 4%. Actually, CMS has not yet told us what that figure is going to be. We felt comfortable going with um, the 4% because it's really not very likely that they're going to do any less than that. So all of that led us to where we are right now. We've got the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015. As you can see, we give you a brief little chronology of what happened. It averts the cuts. It passed the House in the end of March. The Senate took it up when they returned from their recess in April, and, this, and the President signed that bill shortly after the Senate um, passed it. So this brought us sort of each, each uh, payment system, of each conversion factor, sort of has a life cycle. When the Medicaid pro Medicare program was new in 1965, the charges were paid based on UCR, and that lasted till about 1991 when um, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 89 brought us what was known as the Medicare Volume Performance Standard, the MVPS, and that lasted again just those five years until here we are now with the, the BBA gave us SGR, which lasted from 1998 and is going till 2019. 
So as you can see, there are life cycles to each one of these types of payment systems, and we are now entering a very, very new phase and a very important transition moving forward. Um, we did have some issues with MACRA. As you know, it's a complex bill. There's an awful lot in it. But what's not in it, which is a great concern to ASA and its members, it doesn't address the 33% problem. And we understand that is an important issue. We also have some very significant concerns about the annual updates. As Dr. Stead is going to tell you, from, two, um, from now until 2019, the conversion factor update will be 0.5%. Then we're going to move into a period of a no updates, 0% from 2020 to 2025. And remember, without any incentives, just those negative adjustments and with sequestration, those are very big concerns and very, very small numbers. We also have some issues of, about opportunities, maybe you know, we're, our chance to deal with get, AP, get PSH identified as an APM, how we can get that moving forward so that to help you and your practices uh, succeed in this new world. We are able, specialties now have more, more responsibility, more authority, more ability to advance quality measures. And there is support for development of those measures, support for clinical data registries, and support for uh, QCDRs, such as AQI's NACOR. And we're looking that uh, performance practice, performance and assessment improvement activities may also be able to be recognized under MIPS under the clinical improvement activities um, portion of that, which Dr. Stead will talk about more. But there are problems. We understand that. We acknowledge that. Even though SGR is repealed and replaced, um, the, there are significant issues and concerns that we do need to address, and we need to address them thoroughly and promptly because the repercussions are just quite severe if we do not. Um, so, but the other provisions that we want to talk about tonight is the PQRS system that you all know, the value-based payment modifier that you are coming to know, meaningful use, which has been in place for some time, although anesthesiologists have had some unique challenges, are all being put together into one single program. Three wrongs don't make a right is what a colleague of mine in another specialty society said, and I do think it's true here. The problems that we have in those three systems will follow us into MIPS unless we can work to get them adjusted. Um, you take those three programs, add the incentive and adjustment changes that we're going to go over tonight, add the clinical practice improvement activities, and you'll see that MIPS does have some similarity uh, to our current system. And MIPS, again, is just one of the paths that you can choose when this moves forward. You will also have the choice of moving forward via alternative payment methodologies. And with that, I'm going to turn this presentation over to Dr. Sed so he can tell you some of the details about MIPS and APM. Well, thank you, Sharon. So as Sharon pointed out, the SGR repeal with MACRA creates two new tracks for providers. And so everyone's going to have to start making choices. And then starting in 2019, you're going to have to decide whether you're going to use the MIPS reporting system or the alternative payment method. So a couple things to think about. Starting at the bottom here, between now and 2019, we will get a 0.5%, that's a half percent annual update to the conversion factor. There are no adjustments for volume. There are no adjustments for anything else. It's only a half percent increase to the conversion factor. There will be factors that impact the payment rate for a geographic area. So certainly if you're in New York, you're going to have a different geographic, a gypsy, a geographic price cost indices that's different as when, that is what is in Florida or in Los Angeles. However, in 2020, there will be no update to the conversion factor. It will be frozen for five years. And then starting in 2026, the conversion factor will go up by a quarter of a percent if you're on the MIPS program or 0.75% if you're on the alternate payment method. So to make things a little easier to sort these things out, during the rest of the presentation, we'll be using the left arrow in the upper right-hand corner to indicate the MIPS program. And we'll be using the um, arrow pointing to the right to talk about the alternate payment methods. So we're going to first talk about the merit-based incentive 
payment system known as MIPS. Now, the first thing is, is that the MIPS system will replace completely the existing incentive systems that we have. So it is replacing the PQRS, the value-based payment modifier, the, the um, clinical resource. And so overall, and including meaningful use, so overall, what will happen is everything is based on this MIPS payment system. Now, the other thing is, is that all the payments will be adjusted on a composite score that you get for MIPS, and it will be done in a budget-neutral payment mechanism. So and what this means is losers are going to be paying for the winners. And in fact, as in any, anything like this in a zero-based game, um, you're going to have significant changes in how that, how that is reflected in your score. For the first two years, physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, including CRNAs and AAs, dentists, podiatrists, and chiropractors will be eligible for the MIP system. Starting in 2021, the secretary may add other providers into the MIPS program. So it is active for us starting in 2019. Now, the MIPS system will have four performance categories, quality, resource use, clinical practice improvement activities, and meaningful use. There will be a score assigned to each one of these, and the total possible points will be 100 points. The secretary will set a threshold each year that's equal to either the mean or the median of the composite scores from the previous year in order to establish what's known as the threshold. So if we look at this graphically, in year one, the secretary sets the threshold. In year two, they compare to the threshold, and a new threshold is set. So in the first year, the Secretary of HHS will be using the mean or median. However, after year one, the Secretary has freedom to actually adjust the threshold somewhat different from the mean or median score. By year three, they'll compare the results to the year two threshold, and then they'll set a new threshold and so on. So you're always looking at your previous year's score to establish what the new threshold will be. Now, the category weights will vary, but in the first year, meaningful use will count for 25%, PQRS and QCDR measures 30%, clinical practice and improvement activities, which would be care coordination, HCAPs, patient satisfaction scores, et cetera, would be 15%, and the resource use will be those cost measures and patient attri um, attribution, and they'll be for the 30%. So the resource use measures will be weighted less during the first two years of the program, reaching 30% start, starting on the third year. And so it's really important to understand that if you don't have a score in a given area, it's still not clear how that will be given to you. In other words, if you don't do an EHR and you don't do meaningful use, as we understand it, the secretary can establish a minimum level if you're not participating. However, it isn't clear whether that will be an average score or zero. So you can see that for anesthesiology, where we currently have a few PQRS measures and we have QCDR measures, that's where we're principally participating. So it's very important that we be able to participate in the other three categories. <clears throat> now, under the quality system, we're using both the current and the new measures. Now, measure development is going to be solicited by the secretary from various societies. We'll also be able to use qualified clinical data registries, QCDR, such as NACOR. And these measures will be published annually, annually after a comment period. Again, the details on this are not fully explained, but we expect to be seeing measures published as part of a proposed rule, final rule model. In terms of resource use, it will probably look very much like the value-based purchasing modifier uh, program. And this may be adjusted via the rulemaking process. 
So what will happen is where you have codes, CPT codes, that you're reporting on a patient, it may be used to describe a relationship for attribution. In other words, I'm responsible for these particular costs. Again, in anesthesiology, we don't have a lot of impact on the total cost of care. And so it's unclear how we're going to be able to do resource use. And it's something that the ASA is working on now and we'll be discussing with the Secretary of HHS. In terms of clinical practice improvement activities, these have not been determined. It could be something, for instance, like the use of checklists. It could be MOCA, maintenance of certification. It could be participation in a qualified clinical data registry. Again, ASA will be talking to the Secretary to make sure that we, as anesthesiologists, can report clinical practice improvement activities. And finally, meaningful use. As many of you know, anesthesiology enjoys an exemption that will last through 2018. However, it's pretty clear that we're going to have to participate in EHR and meaningful use programs in the future. The current definitions of meaningful use really preclude a lot of anesthesiologists and anesthesia groups from participating. And so we're going to have to work with the Secretary to see if we can define meaningful use programs that are specialty specific, such as for anesthesiology. <clears throat> now the scoring is interesting. For each eligible professional, so anesthesiologist, nurse anesthetist, AA, is compared against the threshold. EPs with a score less than the threshold will have a negative MIPS payment adjustment. So if you don't meet the mean or median on the first year, your scores will have a negative adjustment on payment. EPs with scores equal to the threshold score remain neutral. And EPs with scores greater than the threshold score will have a positive adjustment. So everybody can avoid a negative adjustment if they score above the threshold. However, that's pretty unlikely. Now, each year has a different payment adjustment. In 2019, it's up to 4%. In 2020, up to 5%. 2021, 7%. 2022 forward, 9%. But remember, these adjustments work both ways, so that these are negative adjustments or potentially positive adjustments. But the positive adjustments are scaled to maintain budget neutrality. So if there's lots and lots and lots of negative adjustments, there will be more money available for positive adjustments. And those positive adjustments can, are scaled upwards to a maximum of three times the payment adjustment. So if you look at the system on an overall basis, this is a waterfall chart. You can see the payment, as it's currently defined, is in the dark line with the open circles. The sequestration is the orange line across the top. That's the automatic 2% across the board budgetary cut that we all face. The bonus that's in place from 2015 through 2019 is the half percent in the green bar. And you can see that the MIPS penalties add up very quickly. And by 2022, the MIPS penalty, in addition to the sequestration and getting no uh, bonus increases, no payment increases, will reach minus 11%. So there are big penalties possible if you do not participate in MIPS and you do not get good scores, i.e., above the threshold. Now, as I mentioned before, the positive adjustments are scaled up to a factor of three. And in addition, top performers, and those top performers have not been precisely defined, but for now, let's, I believe it would be those top performers who would be um, at uh, the top uh, quartile would get an adjustment of up to 10%. Now, those participants who fail in the alternate payment model system, and we'll talk about that in a second, won't qualify for a bonus on, on the APM side, but they could report MIPS measures and still receive some incentives. So the MIPS system is not only for those 
who are not reporting alternate payment methods, but it's those in the alternate payment methods who fail to be able to get the bonus requirements, which we'll talk about shortly. Now what I've got here is a graph that shows you the MIP score on the x-axis, 0 to 100, and the percent of increase or decrease that you could see. So when you see eligible professionals with scores that are less than the 25th percentile, so for the sake of argument we're saying who had MIP scores of 12 and a half or less, they are going to be subject to the maximum negative adjustment of 4%. If you had the, the median score here is 50, if you're at the threshold, you'd neither get an adjustment upward or downward, be zero. And if you were um, having a threshold score above 50, then you would be enjoying an increase in your adjustment somewhere between 4 and 9% through year 2022. If you look in detail about this, you can see that if there are more penalties than rewards, you see the dotted red line indicates that you could get perhaps as much as a 12% increase above your current Medicare conversion factor rate. And if, you are, if there are more awards than penalties, then the factor will drop significantly below the 4% in this particular example would in fact only be half. So again, the winners pay for the losers, but the maximum amount of money that would be available to the winners if there were a huge amount of losers would be three times the maximum penalty. So positive adjustments are scaled to maintain budget neutrality. Now, after 2019, there's going to be an additional $500 million to be shared by eligible professionals whose score is equal to or greater than the 25th percentile of the range between the threshold and the maximum score of 100, or the 25th percentile of the actual ranges of scores that exceed the threshold. So as I mentioned before, those people who may be eligible for up to a 10% kicker would be those who score in the upper quartile. Let's talk a little bit about the alternative payment models, or APM. So if you notice now, we've stopped talking about MIPS for now, and you'll see in the upper right hand corner the APM arrow. Now the alternative payment models are for those who derive a significant amount of their payments from alternative pay models that include financial risk losses. So in other words, if you are doing a program where you're at risk if the cost of care is more than um, what's expected, then that would be a program that has risk. And so use of quality measures and certified EHRs are exempt from the MIPS adjustments. Now, if you're in an alternative payment model, providers will get an automatic bonus of 5% of your payments from 2019 through 2024. So during that payment period where there are no positive upgrades, upgrades or each provider will get a 5% increase in payments. Now after 2026, those in an alternative payment model will receive an additional 0.75 in the conversion factor updates from 2026 forward. If you're not in an alternate payment model, you'll only receive a 0.25% conversion factor update. Now, there's a definition that's really important on the significant portion of payments. To be eligible for an alternative payment model, 25% of your Medicare fee-for-service payments must be from an APM model for the years 2019 and 2020. By 2021, 50% of your Medicare fee-for-service payments or 50% of all payments and 25% of fee-for-service. So what this is looking at now is if you're in private practice models or perhaps models that are Medicaid APMs, that you would be eligible for using the APM system for 21 and 22. However, by 2023, 75% of your fee for, for 
fee-for-service payments from APMs, or 75% of all payments and at least a quarter of your Medicare fee-for-service payments from APM. So they are going to drive those who have elected for the APM to be essentially using systems that have significant downside risk on the payment side. So this slide basically shows you graphically what you can expect. 25% is required in 2019 through 2020 for Medicare, and there's no requirement for all payers during that time period. 2021-22, 50% Medicare or 50% all payers and 25% of Medicare. And by 2023, 75% of your Medicare payments or 75% of all payers with 25% of Medicare. It's not clear how Medicare will be able to calculate where all your payments are coming from. So it's, it will probably be a self-reporting system where you're going to have to report on some other method a way of determining how much your total payments were and how much were an alternative payment model. Now, currently, there's a few alternate payment models. If you're in a patient-centered medical home, even if it doesn't include the risk of financial losses, you're automatically grandfathered in. If you're an accountable care organization, you're grandfathered in. If you have a model approved by CMMI, then it would be a APM. And then there may also may be models that include providers other than primary care providers that qualify for an APM. We're working very hard to see how the perioperative surgical home will fit in as an alternative payment model. Certainly, it would fit in as an ACO, and we're hoping that it will be in a model that would be approved by CMMI. Now, providers may submit programs for an evaluation by a TAC committee, a technical advisory committee. However, regardless of the evaluation by the TAC, the final decision will be by CMS. What that likely means is even though the TAC agrees with you, CMS may not. So we'll be looking very closely to see what programs um, are successful under the TAC. Now CMS has a clear-cut goal to tie 30% of Medicare fee-for-service payments to quality or value through alternative payment models by 2016, and to tie 50% of all fee-for-service payments to quality or value through APMs by 2018. So there's tremendous pressure to move everyone into APMs. They're also looking to tie 85% of all Medicare fee-for-service payments to quality or value by 2016, and 90% of all Medicare fee-for-service payments by 2018, including other means beyond APMs. What this really means is, is that for you to be successful and be getting the kind of updates that you're looking for, we're going to have to get everyone in anesthesiology into alternative payment models fairly quickly. The APM bonus rewards participation in new models. So as we talked about before, you have to accept risk. In other words, you have to accept that if there is less quality or less financial success, that there is some negative consequence to, to providers and an APM. On the other side, if you're successful, higher quality, or lower cost, that you have the other side of risk, and you can be even successful in an APM just on that alone. In some cases, patient-certified medical homes, as we mentioned before, would qualify. Now, the financial incentives for 2019 through 2024 are 5%. Remember that if you're in the MIP system, there's no increase. So there's also a possibility for partial qualification mechanisms. So if you don't have the numbers that you have, um, if you don't have the numbers that you need in an alternative payment model, it is possible to report the MIPS measures and receive corresponding incentives in the MIPS program. Well, all of this is pretty daunting. Where does this leave us? Well, first of all, HR2, which is MACRA, adds $150 billion over the current spending projections to physicians. However, in the long term, 
It's not quite as good as that. And I'll be showing you a graph in a minute. Is is that macro results in payments that are less than what they would have been under SGR, and even less than the 21.2 percent cut. So in the short run, macro adds some additional cost, but very quickly macro saves a large amount of money. Now this is from the Office of the Actuary, but according to CMS. Absent a change in the method or level of update by subsequent legislation, we expect access to Medicare participating physicians to become a significant issue in the long term under MACRA. What this means is, is, is that physicians will be looking at lesser payments for taking care of Medicare beneficiaries, and the Medicare actuaries are concerned that physicians will not want to take care of Medicare patients because payment levels will be dropping. Now, if you look at MedPAC, which is the Medicare Physician Advisory Commission, I'm sorry, Payment Advisory Commission, they talked about the relationship between physician and other health care providers and their utilization and expenditures. And what they determined was is that there's going to be a significant change in the way that utilization is, is seen. Beneficiaries are going to have a harder time getting access to physicians because of the decreased payments. At the same time, a lot of physicians are not going to want to participate in the quality of care systems. And so there's going to be tremendous pressure to allow a number of providers to provide beneficiary access. The translation here, they're concerned about physicians not wanting to see patients, and they want to go and increase the providers, non-physician providers, a way of providing a stopgap measure for the decreased access to physicians. The General Accounting Office um, is required to submit a report by 2021. It's supposed to look at the composite scores and the MIPS adjustment factors and then look at what happened in terms of utilization and access. And it will provide a number of recommendations looking at the funding for Medicare starting in 2021. Eighteen months after the enactment of MACRA, GAO is also supposed to submit a report to Congress that will compare the use of quality measures in Medicare and the Medicaid programs to private payers and make recommendations to remove, reduce the administrative burden. So it's pretty clear that Congress recognizes we're asking a tremendous amount to report on quality and the other measures, and that they're looking for a check and balance system so that we do not have an arduous amount of reporting to do. So if we're to summarize the tracks that we have from MACRA now, there's two systems. The merit-based incentive system, starting in 2018, will be the last year of separate PQRS meaningful use and value-based modifier penalties. They'll be combined in 2019, and they'll be from a minus 4 to a plus 12 um, payment adjustment made. And then in 2020, it will be minus 5 to plus 15, 2021 minus 7 to 21 percent, in 2022, minus 9 to 27 percent. Remember, the upward number is adjusted such that the scaling factor is capped at 3. So if there's a lot of those who get negative adjustments, there is a lot of money that will be paid out for positive adjustments. However, if very few individuals, practices, or individuals get negative adjustments, the amount of money to pay for the positive adjustments will be very low. And so you're not going to see the, the 15, 21, and 27 percent. What you're going to see is 2, 3, and 4 percent. If you do the advanced alternative payment models, 2019 through 2020, you have to have 25 percent of your Medicare revenue has to be in an alternative payment model. There is a 5 percent bonus for participating in alternative payment models. By 2021, you've got to have an increased amount of Medicare 
or all payer revenue to enjoy any kind of increase. And so it's very important to understand that the MIP system offers a plus and minus system. The alternate payment methods is almost all plus. So it's pretty clear that there's a lot of details that will have to be determined. And we'll be monitoring these. We expect to see them in proposed rules and final rules. But overall, much of the details will probably be done by CMS, and they'll be in the rules making process. We expect to be spending a considerable amount of time speaking with CMS to make sure that we can participate in both MIPS and APM programs. So the positive effects of MACRA HR2, there are no more SGR cuts. There are small but positive updates over the next five years. However, if you're in the MIPS program, there's also negative updates possible. There are certain incentive payments under certain conditions, and we have a single quality program that is yet to be totally defined. If you participate in alternate payment models, that you are exempt from MIPS reporting. However, you have a significant obligation to have many of your payers in these alternate payment methods. So we're looking, as other specialties are, to develop alternate payment models, quality measures, including those that are used in the QCDR. The negative aspects are pretty profound. First of all, there's no negative updates in years 6 through 10. I'm sorry, no updates in years 6 through 10 when inflation rates may be significantly greater than they are now. Remember that inflation is currently at about between 2.1 and 2.6%. So if you look at five years of inflation, you're looking at a negative update effectively of about 12%. There's inadequate rate increases compared to what's expected in terms of cost, even if you look at the Medicare Economic Index, and even in years when updates will be implemented. So that the rate increases that are in there are totally inadequate to even match payment levels that are here today. So we can expect long-term decay of Medicare rates. And so this is going to impact the number of physicians who are wanting to treat Medicare beneficiaries. I personally think that we're going to see a lot of problems in primary care and that we're going to find that it's going to be difficult for our patients to be um, accessing physicians. I think this will also probably increase non-physician care of patients. As Sharon talked about before, this did not address our 33% problem. And worst of all, Congress has now washed their hands. They're unlikely to take this up again soon. And I think that they feel that they fixed this. And I think it will probably be seven to 10 years before we'll be able to readdress this. Now, I promised to show you the prices for, um, that we could have expected pre and post macro. So this graph shows four different lines. So the first line that you see on the top is what is the projected cost of providing care where the adjustments are made for the Medicare Economic Index. So this is effectively the medical inflation, the medical consumer price index. So then we look at the, what's called the projected baseline. Now the projected baseline assumes that the SGR system was used to update physician payments and would have been overridden and replaced with just an annual payment model just like we have been doing over the last 14 or 15 years. In other words, this assumed Congress would have made some adjustments and overrides. The current law refers to the SGR. And the current law shows that it would have been dropping very precipitously in 2015, and then a fairly flat curve out. However, what we are really faced with now is MACRA. And MACRA is HR2. It's the green line that you can see. And it mar marched. It matches the projected baseline for 2015. It's slightly increased. You can see it rise above the projected baseline for years 2016 through 2024. And then it rapidly drops below the projected baseline. And in fact, if, the, if it's in existence 
by 2050, it will have a bigger negative impact than we would have had with the SGR law. So overall, you can expect the prices for physician services, translate that into your conversion factors, real money, in other words, inflation adjusted, is going to be significantly less and can be declining over the next 10 to 15 years, which is what I think we'll probably can expect out of MACRA. So what you can walk away from this today is the SGR repeal solved some problems, but it's going to create a number of challenges for anesthesiologists. ASA will continue to work with CMS to ensure the MIPS program allows for us to successfully report our services and participate as an anesthesiologist practice. We're also going to be continuing to develop alternate payment paradigms and principally the perioperative surgical home model and find ways that it will fit in to the new system. So poll number three here is after participating in this webinar, how do you think the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, MACRA, also HR2, will impact your practice? So we'll give a few minutes here. Please click and score. So it looks like a few practices believe that it will have a somewhat or significant impact, about 15% of you. And we're seeing that the vast majority of you, that it will have a negative impact, either somewhat or significant negative impact. So we're going to leave this, and we're going to look at how you believe this will affect the specialty of anesthesiology. Give it another few seconds. And pretty much the same. We see that there's a few, about 10%, believe that it will have some positive impact, whereas the majority believe that it will have somewhat or a significant negative impact. So at this point, I'm going to turn the program back over to Eric, who will take um, questions. And we're going to ask that you type in your questions in the chat box that you see on the left of your screen. Eric? Thank you very much. Uh, one final reminder to enter those questions. Uh, type them in, and be sure to click on the Send button located next to the box to submit the question. Uh, Dr. Abenstein, would you like to facilitate our questions, please? Sure, that'd be, that'd be great. <coughs> Mike Schweitzer has a question regarding uh, the Medicare Advantage uh, program, does this qualify as an alternate payment model? Uh, Stan or Sharon? Hi, uh, this is Sharon. I'll take that one. Um, right now, the way the bill is written, this, this is addressing Medicare fee-for-service patients. However, down the road, the Secretary is going to take a look to see if and how Medicare Advantage programs should be um, folded into these programs. Thank you. Are there other questions? Oh, it doesn't look like we have any other questions at this time. Do either of our presenters have any closing comments before we wrap everything up? Again, we very much appreciate your time tonight. We understand that these are times that are our unsettling times for anesthesia and all of medicine, and we uh, pledge we will do all we can to make sure you are positioned as well as you can be going forward. I just want to echo uh, Sharon's thanking everyone for participating. Remember that the new systems for calculating our rates will effectively avoid the legislative overrides to the SGR formula. However, it's very unclear how this will um, affect us in the future. And while physician payments may be adequate for a few years, I think what we're really concerned about is the longevity of this legislation. So thank you very much.
Yeah, and thank and you I'd very like much. Well, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I just like to, I'd like to thank everyone as well for uh, signing on tonight. This is very complex, and uh, there's a lot of decisions that are going to need to be made in D.C. about the specifics of how this is going to be implemented. And ASA, uh, both staff as well as the physician leadership, will be actively engaged in influencing how the uh, regulations are formulated uh, to be as beneficial as possible to our patients and our profession. Uh, if anyone has any questions uh, that they would like to share, um, I'm sure, um, certainly I, I'll be happy to uh, field them, as well as Dr. Steed and Sharon. Uh, again, thank you very much for signing on tonight. Thank you very much. On behalf of the American Society of Anesthesiologists, thank you to all of our speakers and, of course, to all of today's participants. Please enjoy the rest of your evening. You may now disconnect.